and enhance comprehension in reading and listening. And we'll also provide strategies that will help to strengthen students' ability to predict, summarize, and recall information of what they read or hear with greater accuracy. We'll talk about um, modifications and strategies that can also help to facilitate communication, um, and we'll discuss those in detail. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So I want to officially uh, begin again by introducing myself and the team. So I'm Dr. Milford, the senior speech language pathologist at the Catherine Thomas High School. This is me. And we also have our amazing team of SLPs. So I'll introduce them one by one. We have uh, Ms. Amanda Athey, Ms. Susan Carpenter, Ms. Amelia Chung, Ms. Esther Getz and Ms. Alyssa Marmer. Our agenda for today will begin with an icebreaker and then we will jump into our presentation. So we will begin by reviewing rece receptive and expressive language definitions, receptive language in listening versus reading, implicit versus explicit information, pre-reading strategies, pre-reading and reading strategies, and then modifications for parents to facilitate comprehension and expressive communication. We'll then follow up with a, a fun activity at the end, and then we, of course, will have time for questions and comments at the end. So we, you can feel free to jot those down, um, just in case you don't wanna forget your question, and we will try our best to get um, to all of our questions and comments, of course. Um, if you do have, like, she. Um, mentioned before, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat or you can ask it out loud, either or is fine. So for our icebreaker, we are going to play a game called Mad Gab. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this game, if this is your first time playing Mad Gab, this is a really, really fun game where um, what you'll see is you'll see some words. And when I say words, they're not actual words, but you'll see um, some letters, I guess, on the slides. When I go through it, you'll see what I mean. And then you have to try to decipher what it is or what it means, okay? So it's a fun game where you will look at the screen and you'll try to combine the words together um, to make it make sense. And once we start, we'll do a, a practice one so you can get an idea of how it all works. So again, you'll see the puzzle on the screen, you'll see the small words, and then we'll put them together to try to make it into something that makes sense. So just a couple of rules. Um, make sure you're muted. Um, one fun tip that I can give you is make sure you say the words out loud to help you decipher each phrase, okay? Um, but you're muted, so you're saying it out loud. And if you say it faster, it can help you determine the meaning faster. So say it fast, say it out loud, and keep saying it until it makes sense, until it makes an intelligible phrase. And then you can type your answer in the chat. Okay, does anyone have a question about that before we get started? I do, it's Deb. Do we type it to everybody or do we just type it to you? Um, you, can, you can just type your answer in, in the chat to everyone, to the group. Great, thanks. You think you know the answer? And so multiple people, of course, can be typing at once. If you think you know the answer, you can type it in the chat. So we'll do a practice one. Okay, so here's the first one. I'm trying to see if I can see the chat here. Yes, so I see a couple of answers coming in, hide and seek, exactly, okay? And I tried to throw in a couple of uh, holiday ones in there just to make it a little bit more exciting. So you'll see a couple of holiday phrases in there. So the first one is hide and seek, okay? So now we're gonna start the real game, <laughs> okay? All right, here we go. Let's see. Yes, 
So someone got it, Okamali Faithful. Good. All right, let's go to the next one. The sky's the limit. So number two is the sky's the limit. Excellent. The most wonderful time of the year. Yep. You guys are good at this. Yep, I saw someone got that one, number four. Oops, I did it again. Number five is see you later. Walking in a winter wonderland, that's number six. Oops, sorry about that. Yes, Wheel of Fortune. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. That's number eight. Okay, I'm gonna move on to number nine. Yes, no strings attached. Now we can move to number 10. There we go. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Number 10, no more Mr. Nice Guy. A blessing. Right? <laughs> okay, number 12. A lucky charm. You guys are on a roll here. <laughs> Should have made it a little harder. <laughs> okay, let's see. Yep, I see one person got it. Hawaiian surfer. Hawaiian surfer. Okay, I think we have maybe two more. Couple people got this one, lost in translation. Oops, I am so sorry. There we go. And then last but not least. The Nutcracker. Wow, I think Elsa Flores wins the prize. Right, I, I, I noticed that. Every single time. <laughs> wow, 
All right. Take the take the take the props also. You are amazing. God. All right. So for some of you, I know that this what may have been a little bit challenging. For some of you, you're like, oh, I'm happy that's over, right? Because it's, it's, it's something new. So some of you may have been familiar with the game. Some of you, this was your first time playing the game. And so sometimes learning something new and in a different way is not always easy. And so for many of our students who have difficulty with language, excuse me, and comprehension, this is what they may experience when they are trying to comprehend language both written and oral. For our students who may also have reading challenges and words are all jumbled on a page, this is how it feels to them as well. I even think about students who may have a, a language disability and who are also second language learners, what it might feel like for them as well. So you can imagine pretty overwhelming, right? So I think we can all agree that students with language disorders, um, they will experience challenges in the classroom as it relates to accessing the academic curriculum. And so we really wanted to take this time to share um, those strategies and um, hopefully, you know, it will be something that you can take away to be able to help students overall in comprehension and communication skills so they can be better communicators. So when I first saw this page, there were a couple of words that immediately jumped out at me. And for everyone, it might be different. Um, for me, the first word that I saw was communication. Um, for some of you, you may see words like understanding, taking turns, uh, words, listening, sentences. For each person, there are different words that will jump out at you immediately. And again, the word in the center is communication and communication encompasses all of these things. So all of these other words that you see, they're all intertwined, right? To make us better communicators. So um, there's some words that are really, really tiny, some words that are a lot larger, makes no difference. All of these words are intertwined. So some of the words that you can barely see um, body language, you have coordination, drawing, words, these are all, all equally as important. So what is language? Language is a rule governed behavior, which means it has grammar or a set of conventions that organizes its proper use. So these rules set boundaries around the meaning of words and it dictates how words relate to one another. So without rules or grammar, languages would be confusing, right? There would be a lot of chaos and it would be pretty meaninglessness. So people would no longer be able to understand or communicate, communicate with each other because we wouldn't have any rules. So language is definitely a rule governed behavior and creates meaning, right? For people to understand and to express themselves. So spoken and written language are composed of receptive and expressive components. And when we talk about um, language comprehension, we're also talking about the ability to connect to and interpret both oral and written language, and also being able to recall facts, um, get the main idea, make an inference, draw a conclusion, predict, evaluate. So these are all things that we want our students to be able to do. And Nancy, <clears throat> excuse me, Nancy Bell, who is um, the creator of Linda Mood Bell, she defines it in a such a meaningful way. Again, being able to make those connections and those interpretations and being able to draw conclusions. These are all really important um, for our for our students, right? Um, to be able to reason from language that is heard and language that is read. So in a nutshell, language can be classified um, as receptive or expressive. When we say receptive, we are um, referring to that as listening or reading comprehension and then expressive meaning speaking or writing. In addition to that, we have the five language domains. Um, they are phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. 
Now, when we talk about phonology, we're talking about the study of speech sounds, right? So the study of the speech sound, the smallest phoneme system of a language, which includes the rules for combining and using phonemes. Um, we also talk about morphology, which is the study of the rules that govern how morphemes are used. So for example, the way you would add an S to mean plural or possessive, or if you wanted to refer to something in present tense, you would use ing. Um, so that's all morphology. Um, next is syntax, which is like the grammar um, that we use. It's the rules that pertain to the ways in which words can be combined to form sentences. So that's the syntax means meaning sentence structure. And then semantics, which refers to the meaning of words and combinations of words in a language. And when we talk about se semantics, we're usually talking about vocabulary. And then finally, pragmatics, which refers to the rules associated with the use of language in conversation and broader social situations. All righty, are you turning it over to me, Dr. Melford? Go ahead. Okay, um, so as we've been saying, uh, we're talking about receptive language comprehension. So receptive language means language coming into your brain, coming into your ears and then being processed into your brain so that you can understand it. As opposed to expressive language, which we'll get to, uh, which is the output. So receptive language is the input. So if you compare listening to a person speak, whether it's live or on television or recording, compared to understanding what you're reading, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, um, of course there are a lot of overlaps, but there are also some distinctions. So number one, in order to understand a person speaking to you or to understand what you're reading, you have to have focus and attention. If you're distracted, if you were more focused on a sound coming from somewhere else, um, you're gonna miss a lot. You're gonna miss the details and that's gonna prevent you from putting together the overall picture. So for sure with reading a text, you, it involves a lot of focus to decode the words um, and to understand what it is that the text is saying. For listening, um, the understanding of nonverbal communication is a huge component to understanding the message that a person is giving you. So you have to understand facial expressions, hand gestures, body language. If you miss any of those, you might completely misinterpret what the message was that the person is giving. Um, and just as a side, um, a number of our students struggle with this understanding of nonverbal communication. We as speech language pathologists in the school setting, in a clinical setting, wherever you are, we work a lot on this component so that um, students are able to understand spoken language uh, in a meaningful way. Um, the ability to use contextual information to understand the meaning of vocabulary uh, falls under both um, categories of listening and reading because if someone says a word to you that you don't know what it means or if you're reading a text and you come across a word that you don't know what it means, then the first thing you want to do is use context clues or if someone's speaking, use, use the context about the topic that they're talking about. And we look, work a lot with our students on this as well. Um, pragmatics is, um, you know, the whole social piece of language, um, the social, social aspects. So you need to understand a person's tone of voice. You need to understand their point of view. Uh, we just started working a lot with understanding sarcasm and irony. Um, we have a number of students who you might be saying something to them in a joking way, like you're just kidding, and they don't understand, um, they don't understand that at all. They take it the wrong way. For example, uh, recently in a class, a teacher um, gave a direction to the kids and she realized as she was saying it, no, wait, I didn't mean to say that. She said, um, 
uh, she said, oh, shoot. Miss Milford, what did she say instead of, oh, she said, I, 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 sorry, I lied. I lied, I didn't mean it. And one of the students got so upset. And he said, well, why are you lying? You're not supposed to lie, people are not. So that's a student who takes things very literally and doesn't have that uh, uh, flexibility of mind to understand different aspects of language, especially around social issues. Um, also both covering both listening and reading you need the ability to hold on to the information in your working memory or your short-term memory to piece all of the pieces together, whether it's in a conversation, following the thread of a conversation, or if it's um, in a story that you're reading or informational text that you're reading. You need to know, you need to understand and remember what was said previously to put it all together to get the big picture. Um, also for reading, um, sort of under the pragmatics and social piece, if you're reading a story, you need to understand the character's motivation, their intention, their point of view, and also the author's purpose. Why would the author write a story like this? Or why would the author um, write a song even? What's the purpose? What's the author's purpose with that? Um, with vocabulary, with reading, we teach the students a lot to use context clues, just like in a conversation, if someone uses a word that you don't understand, you want to try to understand the context that the word was being used in. So the same is true with reading. If you come across a word that you don't understand, look around, we like to say, look around and see if there's any clue that might help you understand what the word means. So we, um, a lot of, like I said before, a lot of overlapping, but two distinct areas of receptive language and comprehension. Okay, vocabulary is a huge component, uh, which I touched on briefly, um, a huge component with um, comprehension. So we have receptive vocabulary and expressive vocabulary. Receptive vocabulary, again, means what's the input, what's coming in. So it refers to words that an individual understands and responds to, even if they don't use those words in their everyday language. Um, and then expressive vocabulary refuse to, refers to words that are spoken or produced by an individual. And most vocabulary, new vocabulary words, um, are acquired through indirect exposure to words. If you think about babies, um, acquiring language, how do they learn what things are called? How, do they, how are they learning to label common objects? Because they're exposed to those words and words that are paired with objects over and over again. So listening to information being read or hearing conversations others are having, reading, that's a big one, reading, and engaging in conversations with people who use higher level language. Um, and you might say, oh, that's a word that I never heard before, I'm gonna to have to look that up or ask the person what it means. And definitely at the middle school and high school levels, more words that are specific to the curriculum are used in classes. And these require direct instruction and multiple expo exposures to learn and use. So direct instruction is the teacher or the speech pathologist or the parent teaching a, a new word to a student and explaining what it means, or what we like to do is have the students look up these new words, get used to using, even if it's an online dictionary, I don't think our students know what paper book dictionaries are anymore, but dictionary.com and there are several uh, online dictionaries, um, get the students in the habit of looking up the words themselves, and then if they still don't understand the definition, then we can use direct instruction to teach it to them. Okay. So then we move to questions. Explicit versus implicit information and questions. So explicit information is information that is clearly stated or very specifically spelled out um, with no uh, vague, there's nothing vague there, it's very specific. So identifying specific factors like 
in a reading, a character's name, uh, what, what is the date, finding the main idea in a text, sequencing events, and following directions. So explicit, explicit questions usually start with who, what, where, and when. Those are the pretty four basic areas. So you could, for example, you might have a sentence, Gerald burned his tongue on his hot tea. You can answer who, you can answer what, we don't know where or when, but um, you, you have a really clear understanding of what, what's happening. As opposed to implicit or indirectly stated or implied information. So this involves having to make inferences and we explain that to our students by saying, making your best guess based on the information that you have, drawing conclusions and making generalizations, and predicting what might happen next, and identifying the mood and the purpose. So implicit questions, also known as higher order thinking questions, because they involve a much higher level of understanding and comprehension, um, usually start with why or how. Um, those are more what we call open-ended questions, where the student has to uh, respond with more than just a yes or a no or a one-word answer. So if you have the same similar example as what we had before, Gerald yelled, ouch, after taking a sip of tea, we don't have the exact information about why he yelled, ouch. So then it brings you to the question, why? Why did he yell out? So then you have to make an inference that the tea was very hot. This is very difficult for our students. This is something that we work on over and over again. Um, getting the kids to think in a more flexible way, getting them to think as we all say, outside the box. Most of the students that we work with um, are very logical, things have to make sense. Um, and to get them to take the risk of making a guess about how or why something happened is a little bit difficult. We do a lot of work with pictures where we show the students um, pictures with no words and ask them to describe what, what do you think is happening? And we might use the words who, what, where, when, how, and why. What, what's happening in the picture? How do you know? What's the clue? What's showing you in the picture what's happening? And the, the students enjoy doing that, but it's definitely not easy. Okay. So what does this have to do with you as parents? And how can you um, use explicit information with your child? So I, I know in every household, there is a lot of frustration around getting your children to do what you ask them to do. Well, I asked him to clean up his room. Well, I asked him to pick up his toys. Well, I asked him, but we have to take a step back and think about how are we providing the directions or the instructions. So the most important is to provide clear verbal and or written instruction for tasks or chores. If you're very specific, explicit, um, it will really help. You wanna explain the purpose of the task. You wanna speak slowly. You wanna use wait time for processing information when asking questions. You wanna present the tasks in small steps and you wanna emphasize information that's important in order to complete the task. So for example, you wouldn't just say clean your room because that could be interpreted in many different ways. A student could go, a child could go to his room, put his shoes in the closet, or no, I have that as an example, but he could go in his room and I don't know, put his dirty clothes in the hamper and say, okay, I'm done. But in the meantime, you can't see the rug in his room. Or just to say, put your things away. That's not explicit. That's a very vague, very general um, direction. But you wanna say, put your clean clothes in the dresser or put your shoes in your bedroom closet. You have to say very specifically, then you wanna wait a minute or two, well, not a minute, a few minutes and say, 
what did I ask you to do? Can you repeat back to me what the direction was? If they can't do it, then you have an opportunity to think, oh, wait, where was the breakdown? Um, and what can I do? How can I rephrase it to make it more clear? Um, so definitely, uh, if you have pictures to pair with the directions, that's always uh, a plus. Okay, so just in, in general, be very specific. Okay, um, some pre-reading strategies. Uh, pre-reading activities can help to increase comprehension of a text. It helps to activate prior knowledge. Um, it can provide a purpose for the reading and it can help motivate students to read. Uh, some pre-reading strategies are uh, pre-teaching vocabulary and previewing the text. And as you're previewing the text, you can read the titles, subtitles, and the author's name, examine different illustrations and pictures within the text, maybe graphs and captions, um, pay close attention to bold or italicized words because that often indicates it's an important vocabulary term. Uh, read the first and last sentences of each paragraph. Brainstorming can help to activate prior knowledge about the topic. And pre-teaching vocabulary and concepts, which I know Ms. Getz just discussed, we use Quizlet and BrainPop quite a bit at Catherine Thomas for this. Establishing a purpose for reading directs the student's attention um, towards a goal and helps focus their attention toward a specific area. And then consider the author. What are they trying to say? What's their point? And what's their reason for writing this? And then finally make some predictions about the text. A helpful tool for pre-reading is the KWL chart. And this can be used as a group or individually. Um, and it helps to provide a framework to help access knowledge prior knowledge of a topic and can also identify what they would like to gain from the topic. So the K stands for no, and that is that activates background knowledge. And it's where students can list everything they know about a topic. The W it, um, is wants and that guides questions to focus on while they're learning, different things that they would like to learn. And then finally, the L is learn which helps determine whether your questions were answered and what new information you learned about the topic. So this is an example of a KWL chart. Um, and let's say that the topic is sharks. In the K, you might list that they live in the ocean, that they are ocean predators, and maybe that great whites are the biggest sharks. Um, what you want to know for the reading, maybe what is their primary diet? What are some different types of sharks? And then in the end, we would reflect on the reading and discuss um, some new things that you've learned. Okay, so now we're going to talk about active reading. So it's not enough for us to just read and comprehend something. We really need to dive into the text and use some strategies to help us really comp uh, comprehend the information. So active reading simply means reading something with a purpose. So we read things because we want to understand and we also want to evaluate what we're reading. So like I said, simply reading and rereading is not an effective way to comprehend or to understand and to learn. Actively and critically engaging with the content can increase comprehension of the material. So some things that we can do, um, this is just one example that we have, but what we can do when we're reading a story, for example, you wanna look for a couple different things. So you wanna start with characters. So the first time a character is introduced, maybe it's just the character's name. It'd be important to highlight it, to underline it, whatever's best for your student. And you want to maybe even write CH in the margin, just making it known that that character is new and it's an important thing to recognize. Then you might see a description of a character. So you wanna make sure you underline that or highlight it, or again, write CH in the margin. And same with if the character's talking about how they feel or how they believe about something, you wanna make sure that you acknowledge that too. Some other things you wanna look out for when you're reading a story or anything really is you wanna look for the characters and then also the setting. 
So where is this taking place? What's the weather like? What are the surrounding details? So with that, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna underline or highlight, or you can also write S in the margin. And then it's really, really important when we're reading to think about the plot. What is the important event that's happening in this story or passage? Same thing as I said before, you can write in the margin, highlight, um, underline, whatever's best for your student is what you're going to want to do. So whatever, however they read or learn best, you're going to um, use that method, whether it's underlining or writing or highlighting um, when they're reading. So a lot of times what we do when we're working with students is we ask guided questions. So skillful readers ask themselves questions all the time when they're reading. So before, during, and after they read in order to gain comprehension of that text. So how do we teach our students this? A lot of times what we do is we model self-guided questions before, during, and after reading. And you probably do this and you might not even realize that you're doing it. And then we encourage students to use this process independently. That's something that we would want them to do. So first we could start with visual modeling if that's best for your student. And that would just be to write down questions. So whether it's in a chart where you have before, during and after, um, you might use sticky notes and put it on a printed out article, or even if you're just writing straight on the paper, that's a really important thing to do. That's a great visual model. You also can just verbally mo model these um, questions and that's called a think aloud strat strategy. So that is where you are just saying these questions aloud. So you might say, hmm, I wonder what the story is gonna be about after you read the title or you see the cover of the book and you say, wow, I wonder what this is gonna be about. Or when you're reading and you learn about the main character, what does the main character want? Hmm, or, this is a question we ask all the time to our students. How do you think this story is gonna end and getting them to really predict and engage with the text? And then a huge topic that we talk about all the time is visualizing. So visualizing is so key in comprehending. So listening to language and making a mental picture is what visualizing is. We do this all the time where we are telling a story and we're thinking about that story in our heads. Or if we read something, we're making this picture, this image in our own minds, and then we're able to better explain it or to understand the story. So we work with a lot of our students on this. Many individuals kind of see the details or the facts there and they just have those details in their heads but we want them to get the gestalt which is the big picture um, and being able to get that big picture and to really understand and visualize that big picture is really important to understanding and reasoning and ultimately visualizing enhances the comprehension of material the reader's comprehension so it's a really important skill Okay, so another strategy is um, creating a summary or a paraphrasing the information, which is essentially just putting the information into your own words. Um, this is something that is a pretty good strategy for our students because when they tell you what you know they gain from the passage that you read, you can see how much they're actually getting from um, from what they read. So. Um, it should include, you know, the main points or ideas to provide an overview of the original information. So a ways of, of doing it is asking, you know, oh, so what was that, what was that paragraph about? What was that paragraph talking about? Questions like that to um, and make it, sometimes making it a little bit general to see um, what they focused on and the information that stuck out to them. Um, it, this is a skill that really requires you to identify the important information um, as opposed to maybe some details that aren't really, that we don't need to remember. Um, and it connects the ideas in a paragraph as well. Um, paraphrasing is usually more detailed than a summary. When we paraphrase, we're taking a sentence um, and changing the information um, to make our own sentence as opposed to summarizing, which is a little bit more general and taking um, more of the main concept or idea as opposed to an individual sentence. So how do we 
identify the important details. We asked the WH questions that uh, Esther kind of went over earlier, who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, keep in mind that, you know, all of this information may not be needed. Like I said, some of the, the details may not be as important. Um, so they can, um, students can create, you know, a one to two sentence summary at the end of the paragraph to kind of give them an idea uh, to remind them, you know, like this is what this paragraph was about. Um, and to highlight the important information if it's like a multi paragraph uh, passage. Um, so for an example might be, you know, the student council will meet this Friday, May 17th at 1pm in the library for the last meeting of the year. So looking at the important information, we find the keywords in the message, student council meeting at one on Friday in the library. Um, so that's kind of um, like a good way to do it to highlight the important facts or um, keywords. Um, you can also complete a plot diagram after finishing a story. Um, I know a lot of the English teachers have been um, have gone over plot diagrams um, to highlight, you know, the main events, the different characters, um, what happened in the story in a cohesive way. So kind of saying like uh, se sequencing the information. Um, and it's a good way of, of, you know, when we give instructions, having them repeat or restate um, to kind of see, do they have the important information in these instructions to know what they're doing next. So this is an example of how you might use this strategy, um, you know, apply it. So um, you have a student has written like a, a sentence to kind of summarize the whole paragraph there. Um, and put it on a sticky note, you know, and they also have some facts highlighted. So um, the way that I think this student used it was they, um, when they looked back to, um, at this for specific information, they were able to identify where they saw a certain fact um, using those one sentence summaries so that they could figure out that, okay, so um, I need a fact about wind power. Um, that's not going to be in the first paragraph. That'll be in the second paragraph. Uh, so it kind of, it helps them to organize the information a little bit better as well. Okay, so here's, these are suggestions to facilitate comprehension. Um, giving students extra processing time. This may look like, um, I know in a school setting, our teachers may, as they go around after discussing something, they may let their students know, we're going to be talking about this. Um, I may call on you to answer a question. Sometimes they might state the question and they'll prompt the student that they'll be coming back to them. So that gives the students some extra processing time to think about their response and to consider it and formulate their response as well. For a parent that might look like, you know, maybe later we will talk about what you did at school or we might talk about your homework or you might state a question about homework and maybe let your student, let your child know that you're gonna be talking about that. That gives them time to think about it. Um, we try to limit the amount of new vocabulary presented at any one time. So sometimes we call this chunking information. We might just give five or six vocabulary words, maybe less, maybe more, depending on the student needs, but limiting that amount so that you're not presenting too many all at once. Providing visual cues and concrete materials to assist learning. We've talked about some of these already this can look like highlighting it can be displaying information instead of simply just asking a student to come up with answers for a question give them the question in in as a visual cue giving it on a display or letting them read it and letting them take notes using pictures anything that's going to give them that tangible thing to look at and help them. It will help them spark their comprehension and understanding of what you're asking. Using gestures or action, whenever you're talking about verbal material, this plays into our pragmatic communication as well that we talked about using our body language, using our voices, gestures will help to facilitate comprehension. Encouraging and using a variety of memory strategies we can use charts, visuals, mnemonics, 
um, using schedules, using, we can use our graphic organizers, writing a list. Uh, when Ms. Getz talked about asking a child to clean a room and when we need to be specific, it's amazing what they can do when you write everything down and ask them to check it off as they go. Um, avoiding sarcasm, ambiguity, um, restating met metaphorical language. Be, just remember that whenever you're talking, abstract ideas are much more difficult. It can be problematic. So it's important to avoid sarcasm or ambiguity for some students who have difficulty understanding what's actually being said and using direct rather than indirect statements. So facilitating expressive communication, uh, we want to use recasting, re repeating back what a student has said, modeling correct pronunciation or sentence structure. We do this in reading often, or even whenever a student answers a question, just repeating back what they've said, but we might model articulation. We might model the sentence structure that would be expected. Using visuals that support expressive language, pictures or written cues, this can often prompt a student to use a longer utterance. So pairing those things, again, using the visual display, using a picture. Helping build a student's vocabulary by creating opportunities for focusing on language production skills, using sorting, grouping, um, explaining similarities and differences. Whenever we're learning vocabulary, being able to give them, you know, comparing and contrasting words. That's why we would use things, um, sorting, grouping in categories helps with vocabulary development. Helping students connect new words and information with their pre-existing knowledge. Talk about what they already know or their own experiences. Often when they're reading and they're reading uh, about a character, it prompts a person just like you do, you think about what have you experienced? What's your connection to what you're reading? And we do that with our students too. Using our graphic organizers, give a visual guide and preparing students for verbal question answering. Again, inform them, let them know what you might want to talk about, what that they might be asked a certain question. Give them preparation time. And this helps to facilitate their expressive communication as well. All righty, so let's do a fun activity with visualizing and verbalizing. Um, I want to see, okay. Uh, Ms. McGinnis, is there a way for me to see everyone in the audience? Or is that not a problem? Um, if you do gallery view for you, you should be able to. It should be up at the top. There's a little um, icon that should come up that says view. Uh, I have it, it with, I clicked on the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine little boxes, but I'm just seeing the speech department. Hmm. If you um, hover over it, there should, an arrow should appear in the bottom right, maybe. Yep, and you, just gallery view. Let me unspotlight you. Maybe that will help. Well, now you're spotlighting Susan. <laughs> oh. Well, it doesn't say that I am. Hmm. I think it depends on how other people have theirs set as well. Well, all right. Well, I guess we can do this in the chat. So if you are... If you read the sentence, or if you were given the sentence, the audacious Hawaiian cat strolled, I think Hawaiian is misspelled, H-A-W-A-I-I-A, and I'm so sorry. I apologize for the misspelling. The audacious Hawaiian cat strolled down the street. This is not a spelling lesson. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I would ask you, and you can put this in the chat, um, what would you, what are you visualizing for the cat? In your mind, it, when you close your eyes or when you're making a mental image of the cat, what to you does the cat look like? Mm. 
Is anybody visualizing a cat? Uh, big, bold, and colorful, fat, orange, and tabby, Garfield in a Hawaiian shirt. He's strutting, a cat in a print shirt. Okay. So then to get more detail, I might ask, what size is the cat? In your own mental image, what size is the cat? So you're giving a lot of good description, but I, as we tell the students, your words are making a mental image in my brain as well. So I'm also trying to picture what you're picturing. So very large, overweight, large like a bobcat, chubby, knee high, those are great descriptions. All right, so how is the cat walking? When you see the word strolled, is he walking on all fours? Is he just walking on his two hind legs? Uh, what does the cat look like as he's strolling? Confident, prancing, head high, tail high, authoritative. Ooh, nice. Like a tiger. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what like a tiger means, but how does a tiger walk? You have to be specific so that I can picture in my mind that the cat is walking like a tiger. Okay, and let's talk about what does this cat look like in terms of colors? Is it a long-haired cat, a short-haired cat? What, is, what colors? He takes risks. <laughs> good one. Give me a good description of what this cat looks like. Orange short hair, perfect. I'm imagining an orange tabby, as some say Garfield-like. Okay, good. And the best part about visualizing and verbalizing is that there's no right or wrong answer. It's what you are picturing in your mind. Okay. And this is what I always tell people. After we finish visualizing this whole sentence, I guarantee if you, if we get together again in a year and I do the same activity and I say, what was that sentence again? Does anybody remember what the sentence was? you will remember word for word what the sentence was even a year from now, maybe even two years from now, because you're creating a mental image of it. So it helps with memory, it helps with comprehension, and it helps with making personal connections. Okay, so I have a pretty good idea in my mind what you're visualizing for the cat that strolled. Now let's talk about the Hawaiian part. What makes this cat Hawaiian? What's specific to this cat I'm sorry that it's spelled wrong, but what is specific to this cat that makes it look Hawaiian? Is it wearing something? Is it doing something? It's the shirt, it's a bold color. He looks like a pineapple. Okay, so in some of your visualizings, this cat is wearing a Hawaiian shirt that's floral, okay. The shirt, short hair in a hot climate, maybe sunglasses, yeah. Yes, it has to be wearing a colorful shirt or be a very highly colored cat, I like it. I'll just tell you, when I first saw this sentence, the first thing that popped into my mind about this cat is that it's walking down the street on its hind legs like a person. Ah, uh, hula skirt, Miss Carpenter. He's wearing a grass skirt and those shell, bikini top shells on his chest and sunglasses for sure. Maybe a hat, a sun hat. And definitely has an attitude. This cat has an attitude. It doesn't matter if he's a boy or a girl. It's what your picture, what's your picture? Uh, okay, down the street. What are we picturing for the street? Where is this cat? Or the dog barking, I just heard. Where is this cat? And what is the, what are the surroundings? Main Street in downtown Honolulu, nice. Anybody else? 
busy street full of humans, beachy small town tourists. So everybody has a different picture. Shopping in the cat district. <laughs> Palm trees. I was just going to ask what's in the background. Nice. We also usually ask what vantage point or what view do you have of the cat? Are you on eye level with the cat? Are you above the cat looking down? Are you in front of the cat looking as it's coming towards you? What's the perspective of how you're looking at this cat? Cowboy shot, I don't know what that means. From inside your car. Oh, so you're driving down the street and you see this cat. You're looking from, so you're taller than the cat. You're looking above and looking down. Knee level, looking up at him. So you're shorter than the cat. Wow, so many different ideas. This is awesome. Okay, so I have a pretty good idea of what the cat looks like. How he's walking down the, he or she is walking down the street. Where, what the street looks like, what his surroundings are. Now we have this word audacious. If you don't know what that word means, that's going to totally mess up your mental image of it. What in the world does audacious mean? And what does it have to do with this Hawaiian cat? If you do know what it means, then you can easily incorporate the word audacious into the attitude of how this cat is strolling down the street, right? Maybe he's, he or she is wearing a shell necklace and twirling it with, an, with his hand on his hip, right? But if you don't know what audacious is, and just like we have with our students who are reading a story, reading a text, they come across a word that they don't know the meaning of, boom, the, co the comprehension is out the window because they can't make a mental image of what's happening. Also, if the plot of a story is too complicated, I know for me personally, if I'm reading a book and I'm having a very hard time making a movie of this book in my mind, what do the characters look like? What's happening in the story? I'm so confused. I put the book down and I'm not the least bit interested. I have to be able to make a mental image of what I'm reading so that I can understand the plot, hold on to that in my working memory, understand what's happening in the story. Okay, so it, for those of you who do know what audacious means, how does that affect how this cat is strolling down the street? If you don't know what audacious means, it's a good opportunity to look it up. Taking risks, that's good. Maybe he runs through the cars, ooh, running across the street. He has catitude. People get out of the way. Nice. I like that catitude. Right. So if you know that audacious means kind of full of yourself and you have an attitude and you think you're better than everybody else, you're going to have a really good picture in your mind of this Hawaiian cat who strolled down the street. Okay, so this is exactly what we do with our students as they're learning new, vo new vocabulary words, as they're reading stories. We chunk the information into smaller parts and stop and say, tell me what you're picturing. Also, in for memory, I do this all the time with students where you say, uh, we started reading a story in our last session and we're going to continue reading the story this week. Who can tell me what we read so far? So many times the students are totally quiet. They have no idea what we read two days ago, three days ago, maybe even yesterday. So I say, go into your uh, mental filing cabinet, open up your mental filing cabinet, leaf through all the files, pull out the one about the story about the dragon. Look at what we met, look at your pictures of what we um, visualized for this dragon. What did he look like? Who were the other characters in the story? And very, very often that clicks something with the student's memory to say, oh yes, it's right there. It's under D for dragon. I filed it. I can just pull it out and I can use that as a reference. Is there a real piece of paper in front of the student? No, there doesn't have to be. 
because they made a mental picture of it. I hope you enjoy that and I hope I see you in a year and you tell me about the audacious Hawaiian cat that strolled down the street. Thank you so much, Esther. So this brings us to the end of our presentation and we're gonna open it up for questions. I am going to stop sharing. And hopefully you were able to take away at least a few strategies um, that you can use with students uh, looking at comprehension, language and all of that. And just a reminder, like it does take practice, like everything that we do with students on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not something that happens overnight. So even with the visualizing and verbalizing, it's a great tool, it's a great strategy, but it does take some practice. So just like Esther did, she didn't like jump right into that vocabulary word that the, that the student may or may not know, but she created a, a whole picture where she's probing and asking questions so that the student can really visualize what that sentence is, is meaning and then finally put it together. So don't get discouraged. You know, if some of these strategies don't work immediately, you just keep practicing them. And I know someone did ask about sharing the presentation afterwards. I'll definitely do that. And you can just, you know, go through the different strategies that we spoke about and see what really works, you know, with with your student, with your child. And um, we are happy to, you know, open it up for any questions and answer any questions that you all may have right now. Feel free to put it in the chat. Um, or if you're brave enough, you can um, ask a question out 